Good evening and Yali Mede. My name is Zara Premji and it's an absolute honor to be back with you today from my living room in Vancouver. Welcome to Summer Reflections where we highlight some of our best programming while we wait for the much anticipated Friday night reflections. For tonight, we will revisit a conversation between Alwais Hussein Charania and Tara Manji entitled Being an Ambassador of Islam in Today's World. With the recent events of highlighting the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the withdrawal of forces from Afghanistan, events like this in the recent weeks have highlighted the importance of representing our faith and understanding of Islam. We hope you enjoy the program. Welcome and Yalmarat everyone. My name is Tara Manji and I'm happy to have the opportunity to exchange with Alvais Hussein Charania today on the topic of being an ambassador of Islam. Alvais Hussein Charania is the national lead of the ambassador program, which is aimed at equipping Jamaati members to better articulate the Shia Imami Ismaili identity while building bridges with others. Yalmarat Hussein. Yali. Thank you for taking the time to help us today articulate our beliefs and values and how they can continue to guide us in today's world. Thank um, you for having me. Pleasure. Maybe just to set the stage, uh, could you start by explaining what does it mean to be an ambassador of Islam and tell us more about this ambassador program that you're leading? Sure. So being ambassador of Islam, um, I would start off by saying that Islam, as we have been um, guided by our Imam many times, is a faith that actually guides all aspects of our life. And some at first would think that this is quite limiting, that you know every aspect of our life must be guided by faith. But it's actually quite liberating because Islam tells us that we can have a social life, we can have fun, we can have a business life, we can have a family, um, et cetera, et cetera, as long as they're all guided by the ethics of the faith. And so when it comes to being an ambassador of the faith, that also means that at all times we're representing our faith if we choose to carry that, that flake with us. And so what I would say then for being ambassador of Islam is that it's actually twofold. One, it is being able to articulate the faith when asked, being able to speak to it, being able to explain certain aspects of the faith. Um, but two, it's really about living the values of the faith. You know, we can be saying as much as we want about Islam, but in the end, people will remember our actions, remember our interactions with them. And so, yeah, I would say it's twofold, the articulation and the living of the values. And so the ambassador program is a relatively new program where, as you said, we're trying to equip Jamaati members um, with the tools to be able to articulate about the faith and about the community and really providing them with frameworks, what we're calling frameworks of how to navigate different types of questions. And I'm hoping today with some of the questions that we'll discuss, I can try to provide some of these frameworks. That's great. Um, I look forward to hearing more about the ambassador program and I'm sure this discussion will bring a little bit more light on those frameworks you're talking about. Um, one thing that I find interesting when you're talking about being an ambassador, not just about what we say, but what we do, so about our actions. And speaking of actions, um, there's been quite a lot of action in the U.S. recently, of course, with the death of uh, George Floyd and the protests and riots happening in the U.S. and everywhere else in the world. I think we're all pondering about social justice and equality among races. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on this situation? And more specifically, what do you think, what would you say our faith and religious identity can help us navigate through this situation? Right, yeah. Um, so, you know, I mentioned about these different frameworks of having such discussions. So one thing that I've learned from some of my mentors and teachers that whenever being asked about something that is of concern, um, something, a situation which you know isn't right. The first thing to always do is to acknowledge the fact that it's not right. And so in this case, actually acknowledge that what happened is an atrocity and what has been happening is horrible. Um, what happened to 
George Floyd, but as well as many others before him, um, the subjugation of black lives in America and just racism in general um, is not right. And so I think that acknowledgement is extremely important. Um, a second thing which I've learned in these types of discussions and others is to always acknowledge what you don't know. So the last few weeks for myself personally have been a huge learning experience when chatting with colleagues in the States, um, just listening, reading, and for me to really learn the difference between racism at a personal level and systemic racism. And so that's what I would do is number two is to acknowledge the fact that there's so much more that I need to learn about what it means, what systemic racism means. And then number three, I would then go into what I can actually contribute towards the conversation. And that is the question around faith and what has our faith taught us um, about such situations. And for this, I would say that it's, it's absolutely clear what our faith says. Um, you know, many of us, many of us might not know, but you know, um, Alana has your mom for each of his jubilees, for the logo of the jubilee, he has chosen an ayat for silver jubilee, golden jubilee, and then the diamond jubilee. And for the most recent one, the diamond jubilee, the ayat that the imam chose is the one that says, O mankind, we have created you male and female, nations and tribes, so you may know one another. And I think those of us who might know that that was the ayat of the jubilee might not know the actual context behind the revelation of that ayat. And so when you go back 1400 years, um, there's this really nice, there's many beautiful stories from the time of our beloved prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him and his progeny. And one in particular, which I think is very relevant today is a narrative between him and one of his close companions, Bilal. And, you know, the prophet was preaching social justice, was preaching equality. Um, and at this time there was slavery in society. And one of the things that the prophet was preaching was a slave, the um, freedom of slaves, for people to free slaves. And because of some of these aspects, but many more aspects, um, the faith of Islam very early on was attractive to some of those who are in the lower caste of society. It wasn't attractive to the elites at first. It was the opposite. And so there were many slaves who actually had accepted the message of Islam. And Bilal was one of them. Now, as I mentioned, the Prophet was encouraging people to free slaves. And one of his companions, Hazrat Abu Bakr, was a wealthy man. And so he used his wealth to free some slaves. And it is known in history, docu it is documented in history about how, and quite graphically about how Bilal was treated by the people who owned him as a slave, um, whipped publicly, dragged across the town publicly, tortured publicly, like I said. Um, and Abu Bakr paid for his freedom. And ever since that freedom, Bilal became a close companion to the Prophet. In fact, some say he was so close, he was like a family member to the Prophet. And the Prophet entrusted him to be the treasurer of the Ummah, to be in charge of the distribution of wealth. That's how much the Prophet trusted him. Now, when the Muslims were finally able to return to Mecca, as we know, they had to leave, some went to Abyssinia, some went to Medina, when they're able to return back and actually claim the Kaaba to be the place of worship of one God. Prophet Muhammad asked Bilal to ascend the Kaaba and to recite the Azan. Now, you know, I learned this from um, Omar Suleiman about just imagining this picture of people all standing on the ground. Many of them used to be figures of authority. Many of them themselves used to be owners of slaves. Um, and now we have this black man standing on top of their place of worship. And remember the Kaaba was considered to be a holy place even before Islam. Mm. And there is Bilal standing on top of the Kaaba with the authority to recite the Azan. 
And they say that many of the people on the ground that day, although they had accepted Islam, that bothered them so much that Bilal was standing up there. And there were racist comments that started to come. And so when it came to the surface, they'd accepted Islam, but they really hadn't accepted the values of Islam. And when the Prophet heard and saw some of these comments that were being made, right then is when he received that revelation and recited it. That, oh mankind, we have made you male and female nations and tribes, so you may know one another. And so when I started by saying that our faith of Islam has made it absolutely clear, by that I meant that it is certain that Islam is 100% against racism and has been trying to fight racism for 1,400 years. Wow. That's really, I mean, a beautiful story. I can't, I can confirm I had never heard it before. No. And uh, I think it speaks something for new. itself. Yeah, yeah, no, clearly something <laughs> new for me. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess it, it's one story that dates back a long time ago, but is there any more recent examples that are this clear, uh, I mean, this illustrative that we can rely on with recent imams or? Yeah, um, and it, it's a, actually a really good point. And it's one of the, one of the many reasons why us as Ismailis are quite fortunate is because we've had that constant reminder. We've had that constant guidance to take some of these values that the prophet introduced and to extend them beyond time and beyond geography. And even just an interesting fact before I come to recent times is Bilal was such a, um, he was had so much love for the prophet and his family that when the prophet passed away, he was heartbroken. And they say that he said that he was never going to recite the Azan um, again. And, um, you know, he had the most beautiful voice. That's why the prophet had asked him to recite the Azan. And he never did recite the Azan again in Medina until Hazrat Hussein and Hazrat Hassan had become adults and they asked him that, can you come back and recite the Azan? And they said that he couldn't say no to them because of the love that he had for the family of the Prophet. And the reason why I think that's an interesting and important story to tell is because we believe that the family of the Prophet are the ones who actually took those values and extended them. So if we do move forward throughout time, um, if we go to our previous Imam, Mawlana Sultan al-Shah alayhi salam, um, he wrote quite a bit. You know, he wrote for newspapers. As you know, he wrote memoirs. He made speeches all the time. And he was always vocal against discrimination. You know, he would write against the racism that he saw when he visited America, racism against black Americans. He wrote about racism that he saw by Europeans in China, in India, um, it's so extremely vocal about discrimination based off of um, race. And he also um, lived those values. And so there's some documented accounts. Um, there's this one account of him. Um, he was the member of the St. Cloud um, Golf Club in Paris, a prestigious golf club. And Sugar Ray Robinson who was a black boxer tried to become a member in that club and his membership was denied because he was black and when the imam heard about this he publicly resigned from the golf club um, another occasion he was eating at a restaurant in a town in between the border of france and switzerland and while he was eating a group of students from senegal had entered the restaurant and they asked for a table and the head waiter said that we're sorry you can't eat here and when the imam overheard this, he got up, went to the waiter, corrected him, and invited the students to come dine with him, and he treated them to their dinner. Hmm. Um, so these, these small accounts that just show us that it's, it's more than just writing and saying, but it's about actually living the life. Mm -hmm. And then we come to our present imam, Malana Hazri Imam, and he's taking it to another level. So, you know, I talked about um, learning the difference between racism at a personal level and at a systemic level. And many of us probably don't think this way, but Hazri Imam preaching pluralism for the last 60 plus years, um, and I know pluralism isn't uh, as buzzworthy as the phrase fighting racism, mm -hmm. but what Imam has been doing through his institutions is actually trying to infuse pluralism 
throughout all aspects of life. And so really, when you think about systemic racism, the, the core issue is lack of pluralism. And if we can actually um, engender pluralism in all aspects of life, that's probably the best way to fight systemic racism. And by, what I mean by all aspects of life is, you know, has your mom in this one interview talked about even when parents are choosing um, children's books for their kids, they should make sure to choose books that have faces of different yeah. people on them. You know, when he was giving um, a speech at one of the annual meetings of the IB in Atlanta, um, Ona has your mom told them that shouldn't students who are in Atlanta learn about Jomo Kenyatta and Muhammad Ali Jinnah just as students in Lahore and Mombasa should learn about Martin Luther King? And shouldn't students in Dhaka learn about Toni Morrison just as students in uh, the States should learn about Tagore? And if we don't know some of these names, we should Google them. And, you know, Hazir Mom is trying to say that if, if from early age we can educate our youth around the world about some of the great heroes from these different ethnicities, from these different races, it'll be a different world. And Azram has taken this notion of pluralism and he's put it into his award for architecture. He's put it into the actual schools that he builds. He's put it into the music initiative, mm -hmm. into the museums, into the healthcare, into the gardens that he builds. If you enter some of the companies that the Imam has founded under the Akhan Fund for Economic Development and you take a look at the diversity of the staff um, that is there, you'll see that it's even in that. Um, it's... He mentions pluralism anytime he's talking to policymakers and when he's talking to his murids. And again, I don't think we grasp what pluralism means. Um, and for me to, to quickly just say that, you know, a lot of times we mix it with diversity. So diversity is a fact. It's the fact that there are different people within a society. Yeah. Pluralism is the active, positive response to that diversity. It's actually making an active effort of appreciating each other, learning more about one another. And like I said, looking at this diversity in, in a positive way. And so Hazir Mom has been combating racism for 60 plus years. Mm -hmm. Through this notion that we don't actually understand fully. And, right. and what I like in your examples, it's this education beyond borders, right? right. You don't have to learn what's happening here you're concerned and you should be concerned about what's going on elsewhere. Right, yeah. And if I can, I, I forgot to say, like the Global Center for Pluralism, you know, he's taken it right. one step further and invested $45 million into that, that center, um, again, to deal with policymakers at that level um, to try to fight this systemic problem. So what would you say, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing all of these great actions and we're talking again about concrete things, investing money, taking small and big actions in every sphere of the world. And I'm wondering now, what can we do? What's the call to action at an individual level for members of Ritramat that are listening today? How can we be in line with our faith, which is clear about the importance of pluralism and is clearly positioned against racism? Right, yeah. So I think I'll start with exactly what you just ended with. Um, to make sure that in our minds and in our vocabulary, we're separating the faith from the individuals who follow the faith. Um, and so again, I, hopefully what we've covered is make it clear that what the faith says about it. And does that mean that all members who follow the faith also live by those values? No, as in the example that we talked about during the moment that Bilal was on top of the Kaaba. So similarly, today, we can't say that all members of the Ummah, all members of the Jamaat are pluralistic. You know, if, if that was the case, then Hazaram wouldn't be constantly reminding mm -hmm. us about that value of pluralism. But I'm hearing a lot of people use the word we when they're talking about um, using the word we as, as, in, as if the faith and the whole community was all represented by one notion. So A, I think we should understand that the faith is clear. Even when it comes to the word we as a jamaat, we should realize that there's quite a bit of diversity within our own jamaat. So we have jamaat members that have come from different ethnic groups, from different parts of the world, 
and therefore have been on different places within the equation of racism. Um, we've had different Jamaati members engage with racism in, in different ways. You know, we have black Ismailis, we have Arab Ismailis, we have Persians, as we know, Central Asians, South Asians. So it's very difficult, and I think it would be incorrect to, to generalize. say, to generalize. Yeah, so that's number one. Uh, number two, I would say, is to be, take this opportunity to be introspective. And again, a lot of this is things that I've learned over this mm-hmm. last few weeks, just by chatting with a lot of my colleagues. And by introspective, I mean to ask ourselves that as individuals um, within our families, within our own social groups, how have we been um, pluralistic? Have we been pluralistic? Are we a part of the problem? Mm-hmm. Have, have our careers benefited from the racism against others um, in our own workplaces? Have we observed it and not said anything? Um, do we hear sometimes our family members or people close to us say things that perhaps we should have discussions about mm-hmm. instead of just letting them pass? Um, as Canadians, how aware, we are, how aware are we of the problems that the Indigenous community is facing? Um, as Ismaili Canadians, how many friends, let's say if I come from an East African background, how many friends do I have from an Afghan background, from Tajik background, and vice versa? Um, do we understand each other's histories? Um, so I think there's, there's quite a bit to, um, to sit back and to think about in terms of, of reflect about how can we improve? Are we actually working towards the goals and the aspirations that our imam has for us? And again, in this notion about how we have such a diverse jamaat, you know, um, one thing that, that I have been reflecting upon is that you know, everyone in the last two weeks has been wanting to see a post, you know, we should all be posting, we should all be saying Making something. Yeah. And, and we all know how IG and Facebook work, you know, people post things all the time and really aren't about that life, you know, mm-hmm. and the same thing can be said here. Um, and so a, it's more than just making a post. Like we said, it's, it's an actual way of life, but B to sit back and think to ourselves that, okay, if we are going to be, um, and we should be angry and upset about this situation, but to reflect upon, should we also be as angry and upset about, for example, what's happening in Yemen today? Should we be as upset about what's been happening in Palestine? Mm-hmm. When the Hazara ethnic group is targeted with violent attacks and events, how many of us are posting about that? Um, mm-hmm. And so, Again, I think it's a time for reflection, a time for us to, to really improve and to really work towards actually living that pluralistic life. Oh, that's, that's really great. I, I think it's important what you just mentioned. We tend to hop on the trend and probably guilty of it too. So I can't say that's something I didn't do. I, I agree with you that this is the right time for introspection and we should use it to make it beyond uh, what's currently happening or this specific situation and look to other situations to which we might be players um, to some extent, even if we don't want to recognize it. And, and the other thing that I like what you said is our faith is about pluralism. Our faith is clear. Now, does it mean all of us are following the way they should be? Maybe not, but can we work towards it? And I think that's key, right? If we can all walk away today with some concrete thing, thinking and, and, and work to try to get better, right, yeah. um, I think that would be really great. And by all means, I would continue the discussion all night. Um, I just want to be conscious of time. So if you don't mind, maybe we can move on to another topic that I think would be really relevant in understanding how, how can we be ambassadors of Islam. And so that's more specific to changing environments in science and technology in general. Um, One example in particular that comes to mind is I realized that 2020, and this seems like forever ago, but in January of 2020, we talked a lot about the environment 
Uh, we had Greta Thunberg uh, in Montreal doing a walk. Um, she urged everyone to tackle the climate crisis. And then early, just two weeks ago, we were celebrating World Environment Day. And I saw a lot of people take position and be proactive about how can we help uh, the environment. So I'm just wondering, how does Islam fit into the conversation around climate change? Um, okay, so again here, um, because Islam, as mentioned in the first question, and, and again, I'm trying to start out all these questions by pointing out these frameworks, that, which will hopefully help answer, um, help us navigate other related questions. Mm. Because Islam actually um, guides all aspects of life, again, in questions like this, we're quite fortunate that, that we can actually speak to them, even though they seem to be not related to faith itself. Because for us, everything is faith. And so... Again, if we go back into history and we look at the example of our prophet, there are so many beautiful stories and anecdotes and hadiths about the environment. So although the notion of climate change didn't exist then, the notion of caring for the environment was there since day one. Um, beautiful stories of him uh, feeding stray animals, of him, you know, this, there was this one facet of faith a webinar, which you can actually watch on, on on I Canada, it was on faith by Alwaiza Aziza Jivraj. And, and there, there was a hadith about um, the, the prophet and his um, followers were doing wazoo, you know, mm -hmm. uh, washing up before prayers. And there was this one man who was using so much water mm -hmm. during the, the washing. And the prophet said, so, uh, so much excess, why so excessive with the, with the water? And, um, the, the person replied to the prophet, that, is, there, is there such a thing as being excessive when it comes to wazoo? And the prophet said, yes, even if it was from a flowing river. Like we, we don't waste, you know, it's part of our Islamic ethic, we don't waste. Um, the prophet used to encourage planting of trees. Um, you know, back then during wars, people used to destroy the crops of their enemies. He uh, forbid that. Um, he would set out areas of nature and say nobody can build here you know today we would call those natural uh, national parks you know where yeah. you can't touch mm -hmm. um, so since then that that ethic of caring for the environment was there and there's many beautiful ayats also that talk about um, not wasting that talk about um, nature and about how there's signs for of the creator in nature all around us so if we fast forward to something more present, you know, Hazar Mam's family and of course Hazar Mam himself have, have taken this, this value of caring for the environment and have, have contextualized it and made it in a way that we can use for such conversations that come up. And they have done so in such a way that we can be having this conversation with someone who doesn't even need to have an understanding of the faith and perhaps doesn't even have the desire to be talking about faith at all, but is purely concerned just with climate change. And, you know, I've heard this one scholar say that us Muslims should be talking about Islam without saying the word Islam. And we should be talking about Allah without actually having to say it, the name of Allah. And if you watch the presentation by Prince Hussein at the EAT forum, E A T, forum it's on youtube and anybody who's watching this if you haven't seen that please watch it um if you have not seen prince ali muhammad's two documentaries uh, called up uh, close to home um one is on northern areas of pakistan one is on uh al azhar park if you haven't watched them please watch them and in in my personal opinion when i watch those i actually see that they are speaking about Islam and about mm -hmm. God without, yeah, without having to actually say it. So they're doing it in a non-threatening way, knowing that their audience are people who might come from different faiths, might not even have believe in a faith, but it's focusing on these shared values that we have. Um, and so again here, if someone ever asked about climate change, number one, to acknowledge the fact that it is a problem, um, 
try to give examples of um, from the beginning of Islam what um, what values were put in place for us to actually care about this, and to give example of present day endeavors by Muslims. And of mm-hmm. course, there's many other Muslims outside the, um, our Jamaat and outside of our Imam's family, but to give those kind of examples. And um, just before I move on, like both, both Prince Ali Muhammad and, and Prince Hussein have done quite a bit in this, in this um, field. And Prince Hussein also has um, his own uh, photography um, institution called Focused on Nature, um, which he uh, photographs wildlife and money from that wildlife goes towards endeavors for um, the protection of the environment. Mm-hmm. And Prince Aduddin has your mom's uncle had the Bellary Foundation, which was dedicated to the preservation of the environment. And now Prince Rahim and Princess Salwa um, are leading an environmental committee with the AKDN. And of course, Hazri Mam, with all the parks that he's created and all the trees that the AKDN plants. And, you know, when Prince Odin passed away, the Bell Reef Foundation actually got merged into the Akan Foundation. So there's tons of examples to, uh-huh. to draw upon as to our response to climate change. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. I, I was starting to count how many examples you were giving, but clearly <laughs> we have plenty that we can draw upon. That That's wonderful. And you said something that um, stuck with me. And I think you were mentioning how we can speak uh, to our values without talking about Islam. Um, I do recall saying in, in many contexts that we don't want, however, people to think that members of the um, Imamic family are doing any of this out of philanthropy, right? That this is not me caring about the environment as an individual. It's me doing it because it's part of the imam's mandate because it's part of islam's values so i guess there's a way to make sure that people understand this is not one person wanting to do it and i think your examples show it It, it's constant right right and it's throughout our faith oh yeah and and that's a great point that um i think well even if we're not saying explicitly Mm -hmm. that hey we're doing this because of faith i think it's we should be um, confident in our understanding that why, why we're doing it. Um, and hopefully the, those who are receiving this knowledge or who are interacting with us are able to make that link to our Muslim identity um, through other conversations, through actions, etc. Maybe following up a little bit on that, I find interesting that climate change uh, itself is indirectly addressed, right, in the Quran and different hayats by the fact that we're talking about the care for the environment. How would we deal, what would be your framework of thought if you were thinking of new science discoveries that might be maybe more contentious, uh, that might have happened in the past centuries and for which there aren't any clear references and there aren't clear guidance from the Imam even on how do we deal with that as a Muslim Ismaili Shia. Right, yeah. So if we think about some recent discoveries in science, so first, maybe even before we we go to one, if we look at the last 1400 years, there obviously were many discoveries in science, in medicine, et cetera, that, has, that have taken place. And somehow our Muslim intellectuals and just our mm-hmm. Uma in general have been able to, to navigate okay. those and, and to decide, okay, which way should we go? You know, does this fall within our ethic system? Does it not? Should we adopt it? Should we not? Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the past they did quite well um, in terms of being able to not only make use of these scientific discoveries, but as you just pointed out, to actually contribute towards them. And uh, again, you know, there's a, a webinar on IA Canada, uh, it's illuminated game show on Muslim masterminds that talks about a lot of these, these contributions. And um, so that's the first thing that I would say is that um, for us, it's good to make clear that in our interpretation of Islam, Islam and knowledge go hand in hand. Islam and science go hand in hand and are by no means do they conflict mm-hmm. with one another. And so in order for us to say that, it is good to give examples of where we have been able to 
to adapt to new discoveries, like you said, that are not actually um, weren't around during the time of the Prophet. So if we choose one, modern day one, for example, organ donation. Um, in uh, this one book, it's published by the IAS called The Companion to Muslim Ethics. It's edited by Amin Saju. And um, there's a chapter in there, a chapter on health. And there's actually some interesting case studies there. So one of the case studies is on organ donation. And so it talks about um, a young a boy who was tragically had just passed away from a car accident, I believe. And there was a match for one of his organs. And so the, the doctor quickly went to the mother while the mother was still in shock for of losing her son and said that we have, we have a match for one of his organs. Are you comfortable mm -hmm. with, with them being donated? And this is a Muslim family and the, the family didn't know what to do. And so they called upon their, a scholar within their community to ask what can be done. Now, here's an example of a, uh, what you could call an ethical dilemma. Okay. And in any ethical dilemma, what really what that means is that there are values which are important to you on two sides of the equation, and you don't know which one is more important. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, and, and again here, you know, the, the whole point of the ambassador program and what I'm trying to do here is not to necessarily give answers, but to give these different frameworks. And so in this case, the framework that was used is really a value sorting framework. Um, and so if you just take a step back about value sorting, you know, someone uh, just yesterday said, oh yeah, value sorting, like even, let's say you're in your car and you told a friend that you're going to be there at 5.30 to, to help them with something and you're running late mm -hmm. and you're deciding, should I speed or not? That itself is us going through this value sorting exercise. So we go through it hundreds of times a day. We just don't consciously realize that that's what we're doing. Um, so in that case, the value is, do we listen to the law or do you want to be there to make sure you're loyal to your friend? And what's, what's more important to you? So to go back to this, um, this case what's study. What's the answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I like said, I can't give answers, but, um, um, so back to this case study, they, they were saying that, okay, the, the two values that were in conflict here were a, the value of that Islam traditionally, and in many of the cultures that where Islam is prevalent, the, the notion of mutilating the body, um, has been looked down upon that we shouldn't mm -hmm. be mutilating the body, shouldn't be harming the body, um, by choice. And the one that conflicts with it is this notion, this Quranic notion of saving one life is as if you've saved all of humanity. And so in this case, the scholar said that it's clear Islam puts more emphasis on saving lives than it does on the other one. And so in this case, the scholar said that, oh, like if, if you would like, then for sure you can donate your son's organs if it means that it's going to save someone else's life. And if it means that it's not going to impact his own life. And in this case, he had already passed away. So again, with that example, like I said, I think we can use those, um, that, that value sorting tool. But be before moving on, I would just say a couple things. Is A, that I think when Imam has guided us about the importance of values and constantly constantly stresses this importance of values and constantly stresses the role of the intellect in our interpretation of islam mm -hmm. i think he is moving us to a pathway that, that can actually help answer some of these and so um i think we're lucky to actually have that door opened to us by the imam um and the um this notion of an imam has said it in um, the 25th anniversary of the IAS after there was a conference of the Quran and there when Hazaram was talking about interpreting um, mm -hmm. the, the Quran, he said that, that Muslims believe that Allah is forgiving in all sincere attempts at interpreting his word, Allah's word. Um, and so that word sincere is very key here, I think, because when there is a situation that we're in where uh, there's no clear um, 
guidance, whether it's in the Quran, the Hadiths, or the Fermans. And by this, I mean, there's no direct guidance. Mm -hmm. And when Imam has given us this, this uh, window of, you know, you know what values are important to us as Islam, you also have the intellect and he's given us this guidance to be sincere in our attempts. We have to make sure that we are sincere and we're not just choosing things that, that benefit us or things that the easy way out. Hopefully that helps with, with that type of question um, and yeah. other ones that are related to it. No, that's a, that's a great tool. I think um, as a lawyer, that's something we also use. So it's, uh, it's a common tool that is being used when trying to balance uh, values and rights that are protected by the charter. You're allowed to limit one's right to the extent that it's in favor of another right that trumps, right? That is more important. So this exercise of understanding what are the values that are conflicting and then reconciling. Uh, I do like the idea of being sincere. I'm not sure lawyers always are when they're doing this balancing exercise, but um, it's a clear example again, that our faith is one of intellect and that we have, as you mentioned, that ability to use our intellect in a sincere way and use the values in our history um, to guide us. So it doesn't just become us um, picking the answer we wish. Right. Yeah. Maybe just um, gonna squeeze in one last question. Um, we're talking about being ambassadors and ambassador has to build bridges with others. And so we've mentioned also earlier, being able to speak to someone about her religion without saying uh, the word Islam or talking about the religion itself, but just its values. What if you were speaking to someone who follows another religion, who has their own belief and their own religious identity, what would be the best way to articulate our beliefs, knowing their own position of faith? Right, yeah. So, again, in terms of um, this, these, these frameworks, you know, we were just like we were taught when we were young that anytime we read something, we should, before believing in it, we should ask ourselves who, what, when, where, and why. Um, similarly, you know, as as a wise in, when we get trained, you know, our, our teacher, um, otherwise Karim Gulamali, would always tell us, think about your your the perspectives. So really, I think to think about the who, what, when, where, and why, what we're saying, and about our audience. So who is the audience? Uh, what could be their motivation for asking such a question? Uh, when timing? You know, is, is this person that you're talking to, are you just in the kitchen at work and they've just tried to warm up their lasagna in the microwave for two minutes and have quickly asked you a question? And you know they have a religious background, and, but really they're just trying to kill time. Um, so I think, and what is their background? Are they atheists? Do they come from a faith-based background? And so I think all of these questions are good to ask yourselves first before actually um, giving um, thoughts about a question. So in this case, you provided like a specific scenario where is someone who comes from a faith background. And so when that is the case and we have a bit of information about the other, I think it's always good to start with commonalities. Uh, start with building bridges. And uh -huh. again, because A, our faith has been around for so long, um, B, because our faith looks at itself as being a continuation of other faiths and see because of this pluralistic outlook that our imam has guided us towards we're very fortunate that we can have these conversations and actually find commonalities with many different types of believers and even non-believers mm -hmm. um, so let me give you an example of let's say the person that we're talking to comes from a christian background right um, right off the bat just by saying that we believe in one God, and in fact, the same God, you know, the same God that Christians believe sent Jesus is the same one that we believe sent Prophet Muhammad. Um, and just by saying that, just by saying that, you know, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad was the final prophet, but before him, we believe in many others, including Adam and Abraham and Moses and Jesus um, and Noah. Uh, I know just from our own personal account one of my colleagues at work who was a practicing christian when i told him that um you know he he was 50 something at the time and he said 
I've been a practicing Christian, Christian all my life. And this is the first time I'm hearing that, that Muslims believe in Jesus. They said, no one's ever told me that before. Um, and so just there, just building that, that um, commonality. Um, and then, you know, if it also went into, okay, well, what is the role of the imam? Then we can talk about this belief of the need for continuous guidance. And then we believe prophethood ended with the prophet. But we believe that after him, um, we have imams who are still here to provide guidance for the community. And again, it all depends on where, how long you have the conversation, how much are they probing, how sincere are they. And again, specifically to this discussion with Christians, you know, if there was the time and the desire, you could share a lot of stories of this shared history. So a couple quick, I think we have some time, so I'll share a couple of quick stories, which I really like. Um, one was that, as we know, when the Prophet did start to preach about Islam, things became quite dangerous for the Muslims. And so they were asked to, uh, sorry, they were asked by the Prophet, some of them were asked that it's better for your safety to leave Mecca. And the first place that he sent them to um, was Abyssinia. And he said, if you go here, you'll find a place of sincere religion. And they went there and it was a Christian kingdom. Mm -hmm. And they went to the palace of the Christian king and one of them recited an ayat from the Quran of Mary. And it was so beautifully recited and the ayat itself was so beautiful that they say the Christian king had tears in his eyes and he offered protection to the Muslims. And as we know, Mary's the most referenced woman by name in the Quran. Um, another really nice story, when all the Muslims were finally able to return back, you know, we mentioned about the, uh, about the story of Bilal and the Kaaba. Well, as we know, the Prophet asked his companions to remove all of the statues and the paintings that were inside the Kaaba because the belief was that this was a place of worship established by Abraham to be a place of worship of one God. Um, but Ibn Ishaq, who was the, the earliest biographer of the Prophet, he writes in, this, in his version of the Prophet's biography that the Prophet first went to one of these paintings and put his hands around it. And he said, remove all within here except that which is beneath my hands. So they removed everything else. And then that one painting he put back up and it's, it is said that that painting remained in the Kaaba for the rest of his life and that it was a painting of Mary and Jesus. Uh -huh. Again, just showing that love and respect that Islam had for and has for the previous prophets. So there is quite a bit that, that, can, be, um, that can be said. Like I said, we're, we're lucky that we have such stories for um, so many different faiths um, with shared history. And it also just reminds me of, I think, you know, one interview when they asked Hazir Mama about um, one of his favorite artifacts in the museum and mm -hmm. talked about the astrolab. And, um, and um, is it astrolab or astrolabe? I keep forgetting. Astrolab. Astrolab. And said um, on it, there's inscriptions in Arabic, in Latin, and in Hebrew. Again, showing that there has been times in our history where we've all worked together. And the museum, museum itself is an example of Hadzirman using something that multiple um, societies, multiple civilizations, multiple faiths have in common, and that is art. So uh -huh. bringing people together over something that is not correcting mm -hmm. culture, exactly. Yeah. I find this super interesting, and I think with Christianity, as you said, I've had encounters with people who were surprised to know that we believed in a lot of similar thoughts and we believed in the in Jesus as a prophet. Um, in Quebec and I think in other occidental places, we encounter a lot more people with no faith background and with some sort of, I want to say, discomfort mm -hmm. to talk about religion in general. And so you mentioned you can use the same um, structure with someone who doesn't believe in God and for example would you think of any ways to bring about this commonality that we share with them um, yeah so again with the example of the, the museum you know Hazram 
um, he uses this term cosmopolitan ethic, a set of ethics which actually unite all of us, regardless of what we believe in or what we don't believe in. And I think that is the starting point for conversations with people who don't have faith. And even if they do have faith, if the conversation isn't really about faith, it's that we've been given these values and these ethics and we've been given so many examples of Imam's work and um, really even the Jamaat's work, you know, the, the Jamaati programs such as civic, etc., where we have, we're taking these values, we're acting upon them. And these are all tools to have these, these uh, conversations around something that we're bound to have in common with the people who are, are asking us. Um, so long, long story short, ethics, yeah, values. I have to correct you, it's a smiley civic. As a past CR <laughs> member, I'm going to get uh, hit if I don't correct. Oh, I see. It's smiley, it's smiley yeah. civic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, li I like what you're saying. And I'm thinking about this now. When we talk, um, anytime there are discourse in Canada, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of parallel being made about the fact that we share the same ethics as Canadian and as the Canadian society, irrespective of faith. Mm -hmm. so ultimately, we do that. Um, I'm looking at the time. I probably have three minutes left. And so I just wanted to ask you um, out of curiosity, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here, um, hearing about this ambassador program, it sounds really exciting. Can you tell us a bit more about it? When can, when can we hear more about this? Right. Yeah. So like I said, it's relatively new. Um, the, we've had a couple of pilots so far, and uh, we've, we've had actually three pilots. We've had two in-person pilots where there were eight-week programs for um, certain Jamaati members in Prairies and in Edmonton. We just completed a virtual pilot, and the goal is to continue these, um, these smaller groups uh, to, until we really get the model right. Um, mm -hmm. And so hopefully in the near future, it'll be rolled out to a city near you, the participants, um, either in person or virtually, we're still deciding on that. Um, and the long-term goal of it is a long-term project is to eventually have it open to um, Jamaati members at scale. But until then, you know, there's a lot of programs out there that are, that are really great to tune into. Um, Ask the Y Zine just launched. That's a great program. Um, you know, I've, I already kind of referenced things like Facets of Faith and Illuminated. Those are all great programs for, for learning. Um, and even in terms of the discussion around race and pluralism, there's quite a bit that's, that's being launched. I know the Faisal Kamisa is holding a, hosting a debate in a couple of weeks, which will be on II Canada. And so we had to look out for those. And, and the last thing I want to say about that, when we are turning to uh, resources or even sharing resources, I think it's also important to just always be critical of mm -hmm you know, the who, what, when, where, and why, that because right now, especially with the issue around race and pluralism, there's a lot of information floating around. So to just make sure that we are critical of it when we come across it and before we share it again. But of course, information you see on iicanada.org is, is all great. <laughs> I agree. I think, I mean, we're privileged. There's a lot of material out there right now. I actually took some notes of programs you were referring to um, I could spend hours catching up to all the wonderful content uh, available right now. So I'm sure uh, until we get more uh, of this ambassador program, we can all learn and continue to um, to learn every day a little bit more about our faith and in general uh, educate ourselves on racism or other topics of importance in society. Um, I'm hoping we can send a survey at some point and have a bit of feedback on this uh, interaction yeah. so that uh, we can see if this is something people are interested in continuing this type of discussion. Sure, yeah, I think there will be a feedback link on iicanada.live and so people can use that. And even if there are any questions that have come up, I think you can use the comment section of that, that form to, to send through some questions. Great. So I just want to thank you so much, uh, Alvay Saranya. It's, it's great to speak with you. I'm sure I speak on everyone's behalf when I say this was very insightful, uh, very concrete examples that we can all use uh, in our conversations with diverse people. And um, I'm hoping everyone feels the need uh, to look into all of these topics in a bit more detail and be great ambassadors for Islam, not only in what we say, 
for what we believe, but in, in our actions and our way of life. Thank you. It's been great. Great chatting with you.